Steve Galair or Madden, August on Ahas Arm or Fad, Ve and Shaw Enov, August Buekus, Don Corla Nashunta, Om Edaka Specialta, As Angura Velev. Good morning, everybody. I am delighted to be here in Par I Bark and Croakig in Croke Park as a Kerry woman. I just wanted to get that in at the very start um, this morning. And uh, I just want to thank the National Council for Special Education for inviting me to be here. Um, in the next half an hour or so, we will have an opportunity together to reflect on the last two decades and the major reform agenda with a view to looking towards the future and considering what the implications might be for all of us going forward. So the, um, the presentation is structured this morning around four key themes, the broader societal context, a desire for change, milestones of the reform agenda, and looking towards the future. So when we, when we look back over the past two decades, or indeed any decades in history, what we really realise is that the broader societal context greatly matters. And in relation to special education, this is particularly amplified. In the background of the slide there, you will see a familiar picture of Cathy Sinnott and her son Jamie from the landmark Sinnott case that really changed the face of special education in so many ways. And Bar J in the High Court there said that it's a fact of life, of course, that in times of economic difficulty, basically resources are limited. However, he was very clear that a citizen's constitutional right must be responded to in full by the state. And this recently uh, has been again reiterated by um, the, in, in the case of CTM versus the assessment officer and the HSE in the High Court, where Justice Phelan has clearly said that it is not within anyone's uh, remit really to hollow out statutory rights. So what we know at this point is that the rights of all children, including children with special educational needs, will be vindicated in the courts under the Constitution, but also in relation to any statutory provisions there may be. So, as we all know, we're living in this rapidly evolving national and international environment. And when we look back over the past decades, uh, we had the financial crisis, then the economic recession, and also the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. And on the right there of the screen, you'll see a photograph from Samantha Libreri's report on Ashling McNiff and her son, Jack. Uh, and we were, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were many reports of children and families, and in particular children with special educational needs and the challenges they experienced. And uh, at that point, Ashton referred to being, it being a lonely and uncertain time. So we all know here in this room that we're still the bridge on the bridge back to a post-COVID world that's still very much a work in progress. We are now in a time of great global unrest. And, in the, and also this post-recessionary uh, resurgence that, that we, that's talked about. Um, and in the middle of all of that, there are teacher shortages. And, you know, I, I, when I was preparing this presentation two weeks ago at this point, uh, it was really Pod McGee was my inspiration for that, because Pod McGee, many of you will know, was Director of Special Education at St. Patrick's College, Drumcondra, for, um, for, for up until 2003. And he wrote in 2004 a paper on his observations on the education system. And what he said, I think, is something that is really important for us to hear. What he said was through bad times and good, whether the system moves at a headlong pace, progresses sedately or stalls, the quality of teaching remains for the child with special educational needs more than for any other child, the preeminent influence on the educational outcome. And we saw this week the survey conducted by the INTO and the CPSMA and the IPPN uh, highlighting again the teacher shortages. And we, it, and this actually is a global phenomenon. It's not simply an Irish phenomenon, but it's something that we really will ignore at our pearl and something we certainly need to consider very carefully going forward. Um, Liam Hughes, uh, who's quoted on this slide, and he certainly coined this phrase, a desire for change. Liam Hughes was a civil servant in the Department of Education and Skills from 1989. And during that period, he was also a principal officer in special education section. As part of this project, uh, I had conversations, great conversations with 27 key informants. And what Liam identified 
uh, two decades ago was this desire for change. And at the back of that slide, you will see one of my favourite paintings by Frida Finlay, and she calls it Gathering Dust. But, you know, I think when you look at all of the reports, and you will see many of those reports that we are all familiar with, what it does indicate is that there was a desire for change. But um, as Chris McInerney, who is a lecturer in University of Limerick, he says that the Irish policy system suffers from implementation deficit disorder. And however, while that is true, I would argue that yes, there was a structure was needed because there was such an ambition to ensure that we had this inclusive system, but how to realise that ambition was, was a challenge. So at that time, government, government policy, and that is in 2003, the European Agency for Special Needs Education, which is now the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education. So uh, at that point, they identified Ireland back as far as 2003 as having a policy which would encourage the maximum possible level of inclusion of pupils with special needs into mainstream schools. And of course in 2003, as we know, um, the uh, National Council for Special Education under the Education Act by Minister Noel Dempsey uh, was established and then its functions further elaborated in the Epson Act a year later. So this multi-track approach that we were back in 2003, uh, we were um, identified as adopting. And you can see that there were in, you know, a number of different approaches, the one-track approach, the two-track approach, and Ireland having the multi-track approach. And you will see the different countries there, I'm not going to read them out, you can read them there in the slide, were identified as having different approaches. Um, however, you know, some of this has changed since, but I think it's important for us to locate ourselves where we were um, at, that, at that point in time. So, um, as well as that back then and now, there was an enlightened rhetoric underpinned by a rights-based approach. And I think often in our, you know, in, in, our, in Ireland, we don't take enough credit for our commitment uh, to having a, a, an education system that considers the holistic needs of children and our work in that regard. As far back as 1916 in the proclamation, we all know the cherish all children of the na nation equally. And we know that it was not particularly children, but all citizens. And then in Article 10 in 1922 of the Constitution, uh, it said that all citizens of the Irish Free State had the right to free elementary education. As back far as 1922, um, in the fledgling state, when in the fledgling fledgling state when um, people were really trying to grapple with so much and so many challenges at that time, education was to the fore. And we know, of course, Article um, 42 of the, um, of the 1937 Constitution, the state shall provide for. Uh, and again, uh, we, Ireland participated at that time in the European Convention on Human Rights and the Euro Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to education. And more more interestingly, that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality. And the, the, of course, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and then the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and the Irish legislative context. And I'm just going to go uh, through, the, through the last three uh, individually. And uh, as I, you will see on the slides here that there are maps, and these maps were actually completed by children, young people um, that I had conversations with during this journey. And what, they, what, what we did was we developed maps, or they developed maps, in, in co-constructed the maps, and it, I, I was in their class uh, doing that with them in Middleton uh, CBS. And what, they, what, what the kind of, the, the task was really, was to demonstrate uh, how you see yourself in your school using a map making methodology that my colleagues, um, Dr. Lisa O'Sullivan and Professor Professor Deborah Robinson will talk further about in the context of the other research. But back to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989, and apologies for all of the texts on those slides, but it's always a dangerous thing to paraphrase legislation or conventions. So uh, the right of the child to education, equal opportunity, make primary education compulsory, and different forms of secondary education, and higher education accessible to all on the basis of, um, of capacity. And 
I, there's an, an important part there in terms of Article 23 and a child with a disability was referred to. And this is the first explicit reference to disability as a protected category within an international human rights treaty. So uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Right of the Child came into force in September 1990 and ratified in 1992 by Ireland. Uh, another article of interest here, and pardon the pun, best interests. So we see this term best interests in our own legislation. We see it when uh, we see it in court cases. We see judges when they're determining uh, cases. What is the best interest of the child? And we certainly as educators, it's something that we are concerned with all of all of the time in our work. Um, Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child um, is one that has I would see it impacting phenomenally really in the Irish context and that is because of the commitment of policymakers, because of the commitment of educators to the voice of the child. Are children being consulted in decisions that affect them? And of course we had the constitutional referendum in 2015 and that. Now, legal incorporations of the provisions of the UNCRC have been slow and fragmented It has been and have been criticised and there is much more required to give full effect to the Convention. Nonetheless, I think we, we can agree that significant milestones have been made, um, better outcomes, brighter futures, the National Policy Framework for Children and Young People 2014 to 2020 is really underpinned very much by Article 12 and the centrali centrality of the child's voice in education and the work of Hogna Nog and the Department of Education in this regard further underscore our progress in this area. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it's always good to look at Article 1 and see what exactly the purpose of this was, because it's a convention that's very much talked about at the moment in education. And Ireland was a signatory to the CRPD on the 30th of March 2007, and it came into force in 2008, and subsequently Ireland ratified the convention in March 2018. So there was a delay in our ratification of the Convention, but it is now ratified. So moving on to Article 24. So here, the rights of persons with disabilities to education without discrimination, equal opportunity, not excluded from the general education system on the basis of disability, on an equal basis with others in the communities in which they live. So. In general comment number four in 2016, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities reiterated its position of inclusion as the key to realising the rights to education to be achieved through a process of progressive realisation. And it advised that state parties should move as expeditiously and effectively as possible to achieve the full realisation of Article 24. And that is a discussion that we were, are continuing to have in terms of what Article 24 means for us. And of course, unless um, international conventions are incorporated into law, they do not have legal force. However, they are very much considered by courts making judgments um, and of course the reports that we as a state have to provide in terms of this to the UN also. The legislative context, you'll see all of the, the, the legislation there. And uh, Hardy Manjay, again in the Senate case in 2001, noted that there was a revolution in education legislation. However, Glenn Denning says that law alone, while it can devise the structures with, within which education can be equitably delivered, uh, in order for legislation to be operational, it must create effective and timely enforcement uh, mechanisms. And it mustn't be unwieldy. And as we know, the Department of Education currently are engaging in a widespread consultation and review in relation to the, to the Epson Act. So what are these milestones of the reform agenda? The milestones of the reform agenda, I have identified some of them, not all of them, or I would be here all day uh, in terms of the many milestones over the last decades. But I think that that screenshot there from the government, um, from the government website underscores that there is a commitment uh, there uh, in terms of where we are going with the UNCRPD and our rights-based agenda, which is deeply embedded in our psyche, I think we can say way back as far as I said, 1916. 
So this was, um, for many of you now, we'll be telling our age if we say about Pink Floyd and another brick in the wall. But this was uh, an article actually that appeared in the Law Society Gazette in 2000. And uh, what Liam Hughes again said there, that litigation seemed to be driving policy and not always in the right direction. From all of the views that emerged from the 27 key informants, uh, informants there was a consensus that uh, the uh, intervention of the court cases gave a new impetus to finding and identifying resources and supports that were necessary to implement the reform agenda. And we can say that policy development in Ireland has focused on rectifying the lacunae in provision that were identified by the courts. So again, against this background, the NC SE emerge and was established as an, uh, in, an independent statutory body, as I said, in 2003. And between 2008 and 2021, the NCSE has published three statements of strategy. And here, uh, again, Sydney Blaine, uh, you know, people were under no illusion about the work that lay ahead, considering the decades before. And there was going to be a sea change. However, in order for there to be a sea change, it would involve the sustained, coordinated commitment of many stakeholders. In other words, the NCSE would not be able to do this on their own. What was needed was partnership across the system by all stakeholders. And so we can say, you know, the NCSE had a tabula rasa or a blank canvas. However, it was one underpinned by the distinctive features that had contributed to the evolution of a system of special education, which required reframing and reshaping in order to realise the vision in the Epson Act. And John Coolhan in 1989 talked about education policy in Ireland as there being a proclivity for pragmatic gradualism. In other words, this could, in other words, responding as uh, the need arose, but this was, could be no longer tenable. And the council was clear at that time in all of the st statements when you read them, that what was required now was a significant attitudinal, cultural and societal change to be driven by parents, teachers, schools, representative bodies, education and the health sector, professionals and administrators, relevant statutory bodies and stakeholders. And a number of challenges arose for the NCSE at that time as it began its work, and these were the absence of accurate baseline demographic and prevalence data in relation to special educational needs. And the inability at that time, because of the history of how it had evolved of existing education and health systems to identify the manpower and the financial allocations to special educational needs provision. Um, when we analysed the reports from 2000 to 2000, uh, 2004 to 2022, what we see now emerging, and that was Tom Murray, who was a chair also of the NCSE, um, we can see, and you know, we're all here today, and the minister has spoken in relation to the, um, the various elements of the work that the NCSE does, and the Department of Education and its role in terms of supporting children in schools. We can see that there has been an infrastructure established to coordinate service provision, engage in research, provide policy advice and improve the educational environment for children with special educational needs and their families. Um, a lot done, of course, and there's always, always more to do. But we have moved from pragmatic gradualism to coherent policy development. And this is a quotation from uh, Teresa Griffin, who was one of the key uh, informants in the project, but also CEO of the National Council for Special Education. And Teresa there, uh, you know, provides us really with a glimpse into how the NCSE was working in terms of research, in terms of policy advice, in terms of moving moving um, in the direction of this coherent policy development. And we have not only with the NCSE, but in, in terms of other uh, state bodies, the, um, a, the Research Council, the NCSE their research, the uh, Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, uh, the NCSE again, and of course the uh, NCCA and um, their work. So, Special education is no longer something that's grafted on to, to uh, as it was. Special education is now at the centre of everything we do and very much aligns with the universal design for learning that, um, that we're, we're going to be discussing again in the conference later today. So it's all children and how that is working across the system with the research-led agenda. And again, the focus on the teacher as researcher in initial teacher education, and this is across all higher education institutes. It's a key um, principle of 
the Teaching Council's reaccreditation of uh, teacher education in terms of actually the teacher in the classroom is a researcher and we are acknowledging that and building on that in terms of providing evidence-based practices for our teachers at initial teacher education level and beyond. Professional preparation and in, in terms of our early years educators and also uh, our teachers. And this is Bernie McNally, who is now Secretary General, as we know, of the Department of Education. But as a key informant, she was uh, spoke to me really about her role in early childhood education. And it very much echoes actually what Paul McGee has said, that ultimately we need to continue to focus on teacher education because the teachers are going to be the sole determinant of that child's future in terms of how that child will flourish in the system. So I, I just thought I'd show you the core elements of initial teacher education programme. So this is from the Teaching Council's CAME document and we can see that as we look at those pillars, inclusive education is in there. So right from the start, uh, inclusive education is something that our, our student teachers are engaging with right through their whole continuum of initial teacher education. And that has, the Teaching Council has really made that change in terms of supporting higher education institutes and also the qualifications and the, the professional advisory and qualifications group for uh, early years educators have done similarly. And the more responsive approach to resource allocation, and this has been crucial really because Pat Curtin, uh, who was the former CEO of the NCAC, said in the 1999 resource allocation model, what Pat says is, we were looking at each individual child arriving at the school gate and the first issue for the child with special educational needs was that a resource had to be provided. Now this immediately differentiated them from every other child and this was particularly disconcerting for teachers. So we moved from the GAM, the general allocation model, to the SET-AM and more recently the SIM. So um, we are really as a system continuing to grapple to ensure that we have a responsive resource allocation model that absolutely meets the needs of that child when the child needs his or her needs to be met. Uh, in 2005, this was a key, um, this was a key uh, um, development, the establishment of the Minister, um, of the Office of the Minister for Children. And this is Silda Langford, who uh, was the first director of the Office of the Minister for Children. And what she says, I think, is really interesting in terms of how things happen. And she says the only thing that happened with the Big Bang was free secondary education. Everything else is incremental affecting change at national level and particularly on enabling interdepartmental collaboration um, is challenging. But I think we have really um, incorporated and embedded this approach in our system and we can see this very much in the access and inclusion model. So the access and inclusion model, as we know, um, stemmed from an interdepartmental uh, development group in 2015 and again adopts a universal and a targeted support. And when we look at since the access and inclusion model was launched, there are over 24,000 children have received 53,000 supports in over 4,000 settings nationally. So um, again, the appointment of the Minister of First Minister for State with um, responsibility for special education represents a significant milestone for us and the investment in provision. What we can see, and this is the budget 2023 in numbers and the Minister referred there to the additional funding for the NCSC. And again, in 2024, we have an upward trajectory in terms of numbers. So uh, looking towards the future, so I suppose when we, when we look back, we see that much progress has been made. However, we know also that education as it is a resource dependent right. And again, Pat Curtin there on the slide said that um, experience has taught us that how we use the resources that have been allocated is the determinant of whether we achieve equality of educational opportunities for all learners. So it's not, it's not about being the what, 
but the how. And he thinks the focus has to continue to be on innovation and different approaches, as well as, of course, resources. And that's what we're all about here today. I just wanted to show you the power of this interdepartmental policy making and how it translates into practice. So the first five, of course, adopted an interdepartmental and intergovernmental um, report. And here I'm going to play for you a clip of a student. A student was a former um, a graduate of our program at Mary Matlock College, the Bachelor of Arts in Early Childhood Care and Education. And she subsequently this year just graduated from our Leadership for Inclusion in the Early Years program, which was part of the access and inclusion model. And at this point, 5,153 uh, early childhood teachers have actually completed that program. But I think what Shannon here has to say um, says it all, that we can, when we think that we have interdepartmental collaboration and when we actually see it in practice on the ground with children, the, its power is immense. I um, completed my undergraduate degree in Mary I in a Bachelor's of Early Childhood Care and Education and then I decided to go on and do the LINK programme and I'm now working in Tall Trees Child Care in um, Castle Troy Limerick and I've been here just under two years and became a room leader in May so I'm really happy here. I think what motivated me to apply for the LINK programme was that inclusion is something that's really close to my heart. I have two brothers with autism so I feel like they might not have had a voice growing up so I want to be that voice for them and for all the other children and um, it's great to be back in Mary I again after four years so it's a great college so I'm delighted to have done the LINK programme there. My overall experience was really, really positive. I think um, the, some of the best things about the programme was the flexibility of it. So um, you could do it in your own time, so that was really good. Um, the tutors are constantly there giving you one-on-one -on -one support. And I was a bit afraid that when I did start it, would it be similar to my own course but it, um, that I previously did, but it brings on and adds more information to that course. So it's brilliant to be able to upskill and learn more. So every day is definitely a learning day. <laughs> I think I was probably a little bit shy before I started and then I think from talking to the girls online and the breakout rooms everyone gave each other tips and how to kind of bring them into the workplace so it's definitely helped me professionally and more confidently in my role as well so it fitted perfectly. I started it just before I became a room leader so it's definitely benefited me in that way. I think the module that I enjoyed the most was the portfolio, so at the start it was a bit daunting because I was like, oh god, a portfolio from start to finish of the year, but it was nice to see the journey that you went on that you, from what you started at to the beginning, and it was nice you could make it very personal as well, so you are able to include your family, and for me that was a huge thing because that was one of the reasons that I was doing it. The support and guidance was fantastic. My tutor was available whenever I needed her, even to the fact that she was ringing me and just saying, you can tweak this, you might get a better grade. So they're always there for you 24 seven and an email is never a bother. So yeah, the support was brilliant. Well, I think because uh, I'm conscious of time here, but I, I think what that video really does capture for us is interdepartmental collaboration and its power when it translates onto the, into the ground, but also the power of teacher education um, in supporting our children. So um, just moving on to uh, looking to the future and this robust legislative base, basis, and this is uh, from a very recent court case from uh, Justice Donnelly. So she said, in this ideal world, children with disabilities would be able to have their health and educational needs as assessed and be provided with the services to meet those needs in a timely manner. And at the legislative commitment of the Epson Act is clear and it's located in a concern to provide a system informed by best international practice and creates a presumption in favour of inclusive education and enabling everyone to participate in an inclusive way in society and live independent and fulfilled lives. However, as we know, key sections of the Act have not been commenced, but as I said, the Act is currently under review. And uh, the positive part of that is that we can build on the extensive experience we have now in ensuring that that review encapsulates all of the learning that we have uh, since uh, 2004. The forward planning for school places and as we know, in recent times, the government has faced criticism from parents and necessitating involvement from the Ombudsman in 2022. And it was reported again on the 25th of October uh, this year that 55 children with special education needs remain without a school place, with 44 at primary and 11 at secondary school age. So, uh, the, we, while we are making progress in that area, of course, it's unacceptable that children are without a school place and this is something that we really need to focus on and we are focusing on uh, moving forward. A wraparound system, this, um, this is Rose Desmond who's a principal of a post-primary school who is one of the key informants for the project as well and uh, what she really asked for was 
we need a wraparound system. And I think we're moving towards a wraparound system, but there is, we have still some place to go because she captures it very well when she says, when a child comes in in first year and is presenting with a particular need, we try to meet the need as best we can. There are times we're not able to do it. And that's when parents become disappointed and the child becomes frustrated. So all schools do their best in this regard and end up trying to give as much time and resources that are available. This is when outside supports are needed the most. I'm almost there. So access to opportunities beyond school. Um, this is a, a photograph from uh, Ellen of Ellen Ryan here with her mom and her sister. And Ellen uh, completed the certificate in general learning and professional development, which we have at Mary Immaculate College and other colleges also have the same. But of course, it's not state funded, and we have to do a lot of fund. We have to do a lot of fundraising for for, for the program. And Ellen then progressed on to the Bachelor of Arts in Contemporary Arts and Theatre at Mary Immaculate College. And this is a quotation from Ellen um, from the, from the uh, project. I think what could be done better is that people like me are informed of what they can do. I know Simon Harris is bringing it in, I believe. I follow him on Instagram and I heard it. I was so happy because I know I'm so fortunate to be able to do this and I know it's not the case for everyone. And it breaks my heart. I can see so much potential in people with additional needs. It is about giving them the encouragement and the shove on. And that's like what I had in my first year. You know, when I see people with additional needs, if they put their mind to it, they can do absolutely anything. And the final slide here is building an inclusive education system. And it's very deliberately um, portraying Robert Frost's uh, The Road Not Taken, that poem, about the two roads diverging in the yellow wood. Um, so Ireland is portrayed as operating this multi-track approach. We know that teacher education, curricula, pedagogy and assessment have embraced the concept of progressive universalism in striving to respond to the diversity of children's learning and development needs. The ratification by Ireland of the UN CRPD in March 2018 has provoked a discussion as to what constitutes the obligation of the Convention's signatories to ensure an inclusive education system at all levels. In the Irish context, inclusive education, as we know, has not been explicitly defined in legislation or a definition universally agreed. agreed. Uh, the CRPD has not been incorporated into national law. However, as I said, it has the potential to influence court decisions as part of international law or in spheres of European Union law um, jurisdiction. There is evidence at this juncture of a danger that our concern to create an inclusive education system where diversity is the norm, we are inadvertently reverting to a segregated system in terms of the specialised provision that we deem to be appropriate at this time. And it's we need to reflect carefully on that, and that is what we're doing today. We can continue along the road we have been on or contemplate a road less travelled being mindful of our responsibility that in another hundred years, the path we have taken will have indeed made all the difference. Gaurav Mila, Mahagav Galer. Thank you.